My name's David Abingdon, and uh, I'm the CEO of a company called the Alchemy Network. Now, on your chairs, there is a, uh, there's a folder, and in there, there's um, a couple of bits and pieces about uh, if your sales are sluggish or if you're looking to get more customers. There's also something in there about becoming a consultant um, because we're here today not just to show people how to increase their profits, how to get more customers coming into their business. We're also looking for business-minded people who perhaps uh, are looking to become business consultants. We are a franchise, so uh, just to let you know about that. Um, but let's have a look at this because I want to give you some ideas that are perhaps a little bit different to things that you might have heard before. Uh, just out of interest, how many of you have already got a business? Quick show of hands. Okay, good. All right, well, hopefully you're going to get a few ideas and a few thoughts out of this that maybe you haven't seen before. So here's some powerful strategies and techniques, as it says here, to grow your business. Here's what we're going to cover over the next sort of uh, three or four hours. Uh, no, no, it's, it's just 20 minutes or so. We're going to look at this thing here, number one, mindset change, why you may not be in the business that you think you are. Uh, we're going to explore that. How to get more customers, sales and profits in your business. Now this really comes about from understanding this mindset change. And the third one is for time tested, um, let me get this thing out of here. Four time tested, proven and powerful ways to grow and develop your business and that's regardless of the state of the economy. So, mindset change, number one. Why you might not be in the business that you think you are. Now, something that changed my life quite a while ago was uh, some words from a guy called Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker, for those of you that might not have heard of him, is, uh, was the guy that turned General Motors around the first time he went down the tube. Uh, about 20, 30 years ago. He went on to become a professor at Harvard University or Harvard Business School. And he was well known for his sayings and his writings, his books. But one of the things that really changed my life was this. He said, because its purpose is to create a customer, the business has two and only two functions. Marketing and innovation. Marketing and innovation produce results, all the rest are costs. Now when you think about that, it's got very deep and um, meaningful sort of, uh, deep and meaningful message behind it. Because really, if we concentrate, he's saying on those two things, we're going to grow and develop our business. But what's he mean by innovation? Well, innovation isn't necessarily inventing or coming up with new products, new um, uh, services. Instead, it means something quite different. I want to talk about that. And the other one is marketing. Now, we all know what marketing is, but not many people really in their business are aware that they are, in fact, in a sales and marketing business. Now, I've spoken to lawyers, accountants, I've spoken to people that run shops, and all sorts of other businesses as well. And most people, for some reason, think that they are accountants, or that they are lawyers, or that they are in the hotel business, when in fact they're not. The real business they're in is sales and marketing, because you try being a, an accountant or you try being a lawyer without having any clients. It just doesn't work. So the primary thing is, is to market your services. So all businesses are in the sales and marketing business. And the reason the businesses fail isn't necessarily because they are, uh, have partnership issues or because they, uh, uh, they are undercapitalized. It's because they run out of cash. And they run out of cash because they don't have enough customers because that's where those people come from. Let's get these slides. Oh, here we go. So what business are you really in? Let's have a look at that first to understand this innovation bit. Now, back in the 1840s, in the States, there were some people called the railroad barons. And the railroad barons were these folks that, went, that uh, developed the railroads, as they call them, right across America. And they became very wealthy, very influential, very powerful. And they built these railroads right across America. And really, when you think about it, it was how the West was won. They were able to transport people right across into those Western, into those other territories, and settle the West. And indeed, in many ways, it's how they won the 
Indian wars. They were able to transport soldiers and they were able to transport ordnance to trouble spots, defeat the poor people there, get them to sign treaties, put them on some worthless bit of desert somewhere and then move on to the next battle. And that's how they settled the West, but it was mainly because of the railroads. Now about a hundred years later in the 1930s, 1940s, the descendants of these railroad barons went broke. And the reason they went broke is because they thought that they were in the railroad business. And they weren't. The actual business that they were in was something quite different. Now around that time, Henry Ford started making trucks. And what they should have done is gone to Henry Ford and said, Henry, how many trucks are you making this year? And Henry says, well, we're going to make about 300. Fine, they should have said, you know, we'll, uh, we'll buy the lot. And then put those trucks outside their railroad stations and also uh, build depots for them to deliver goods and to deliver services where their railroads didn't go. But they didn't think about doing any of that. And that's because they had this fixation in their mind that they were in the railroad business. And that's why they went broke. Because the real business they were in was distribution and transportation. But they totally missed it. They saw Henry Ford, they probably did a SWOT analysis and saw him as a threat, when in fact he was an opportunity. So the message here is that maybe we all ought to be thinking and questioning what business we're really in. Let me give you another example of this. Domino's Pizza, I take it everybody's heard of them, yes? Domino's Pizza is a, um, is a, a well-known brand that's spread around the world and done extremely well. In fact, they're one of the biggest franchise fast food brands in the world. Now, how they started out was a couple of brothers in Philadelphia who decided they wanted to grow their business, but they didn't quite know how. So they got together a couple of experts and they asked these experts, look, what can we do? What can we, what can we do to grow our business to sell more pizzas? So they came up with the idea um, of asking these experts to help them to, to, to grow and develop. Now, in the first meeting they had, they said, well, what can we do? And somebody said, well, how about we tell people that we sell or we make a better pizza? Well, that wasn't going to work because everybody was saying that. So they said, well, how about we tell people that we only use the freshest produce? Well, that's all very well, but the fact is, who isn't going to say that they have the freshest produce? So they decided to go away and have a good think about it. And then they came back about a week or so later, and they had another meeting and said, right, what are we going to do then to grow the business? And somebody put their hands up, one of their advisors, and said, well, here's what I think we ought to do. First of all, we've got to forget that we sell pizzas, because that's not what we're doing. And so the two brothers said, well, hang on a minute, that's the business that we're in. No, 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 we're not in the selling pizza business. Think about who it is that buys the pizzas. The people that buy the pizzas, about 60 or 70% of them were students, because their pizza stores were very close to where the universities were. So they said, well, um, okay, well, you know, tell us more about your thoughts on this. And this guy said, well, you know, I've had a look at this. Students are buying the pizzas, they're getting these things delivered. So why are they buying pizzas? Well, the reason they're buying pizzas is because um, they get home back from, the, uh, back from the university, back from the college, after having a hard day and lectures and what have you, and they're hungry. Now, many of them haven't got time to cook. You know, they've got, uh, they've got wild parties to go to, they've got drugs to take, they've got sex to have. That's the kind of thing that students do. And if they've got a bit of time, perhaps they'll write a dissertation. So they buy pizzas because they want satisfaction now. So they suddenly worked out that they weren't in the pizza business, they were in the convenience business. So they came up with a tremendous USP, that's a unique selling proposition, and they said that they said uh, that, uh, they were, that their, their USP was red hot pizza delivered to your door or it's free. And that's what they came out with. They sold their pizzas based on delivery rather than selling it on the pizza itself. So the business they were in, just to really reinforce this, was delivery, was convenience, not the pizza itself. Now they had to change that last bit, or it's free, and what they had to do instead was say guaranteed, because they found that a lot of these students got a bit smart to this, 
got a bit wise to it. And instead, what they, they what they used to do is go out and they'd stop the driver getting there inside of the 30 minutes. So they get the pizza for nothing. Now, the message there that I've really that I'm really trying to say is we have to think about what business we're really in, each and every one of us. Why doesn't marketing work for a lot of people? A couple of guys, Al Reese and Jack Trout, put together, uh, wrote a book in, the 19, in about 1983, 1984, called Positioning. And Positioning was all about this thing we've just been talking about. Where are you? What is your USP? What is different about, about your business? But they also identified something called the clutter factor. And the clutter factor talks about why most people's marketing doesn't work. Think about how many people, how many of us, are going out there, we're advertising, we're doing direct mail, we're making telephone calls, but a lot of it is very ineffective. Now, what they, what they then found out is that back then, in 1984, the average consumer was receiving around about 1,600 marketing messages a day. Now, that's a hell of a lot to, to, uh, to consume. But what actually happened, you think about it, and we open the newspaper, and in the newspaper there are ads. All these people are, are throwing marketing messages at us. Same with the radio, same even when we drive or walk down the street. There are shop signs, there are billboards, and what have you. Now, they, they estimate that there's around about 3,000 commercial messages is of what, what the average person gets. And that's because, of course, the impact of the internet. I think what many of us have to realize is that we're not just marketing or advertising against our competitors. We are marketing and advertising against everybody. Everyone out there that is marketing or advertising is potentially a competitor because they are advertising in the same places that we are. Now, with that in mind, we should be able to try to um, uh, better our marketing by taking that into, and I'm going to show you how to do that, by taking that into consideration. So the crunch here is to remember that your marketing is part of somebody else's clutter. I'm going to get this right. Whoops. So marketing doesn't work because a lot of it is tied in and affected, and it doesn't take consideration of what we call the clutter factor. So a lot of people cut back or they quit marketing altogether. And of course, that's the worst thing you can do. Coca-Cola during the Great Depression actually increased their marketing and increased their market share as a result. Sold a lot more cans and bottles of Coke. So I'm not saying that these things don't work. What I'm saying is incorrectly used or, or not done in an effective manner, they are just regarded as junk by people. So the question for you is, what are you doing to rise out of the clutter? What are you doing to ensure that your stuff isn't junk? So let's have a look at how that actually works. So the second part here is how to get more customers, sales and profits. Now there are three main reasons why people don't buy. Number one, they've got no money. Number two is that they've got no need. And the third one is because there is no trust. Now there isn't much you can do about this one and this one. If they don't have any money, if they don't have the need, why are we bothering with them? The sad but, but true fact is, many of us do. We don't find out about these two things until it's too late. So we're wasting our time talking and trying to sell to people that haven't got the need or haven't got the money to buy from us. The biggest one of all that we can do something about is this matter of trust. How can we develop more trust, more confidence? Let's explore that. As I said, not much you can do about the first two, but there's a lot you can do about this. What we have to do is develop more trust, believability uh, in, in us so that they will do business with us, with you. And there are three very quick ways that you can do this. Now they say, don't they, that, um, uh, that reputation takes years to build and only moments to, to destroy. Well, let me tell you, you can build reputation very quickly, particularly in this day of the internet. And the way you do that is by using these three methods, testimonials, guarantees, and positioning. Now, positioning we've spoken about, it's working out who you really are and what business that you're really in. Give you another quick story. I use a hotel to run seminars and training in the Cotswolds. Now, this hotel is nestled on the side of a hill in a lovely valley 
there's a, a little um, uh, pond or lake at the bottom, and there's woods on the hills. And I noticed that using this hotel, that during the week the place empties out, there's only us and maybe another conference going on. But during the weekend, the place fills up with couples. And I recall sitting down with the manager of the hotel and saying, look, what business are you, are you in? And she knew what I did, and she said to me, well, we're in the hotel business, we're in the accommodation business. No, they weren't. And the reason they weren't is that these couples that used to turn up on a Friday, they'd stay till Sunday, and you used to see them going hand in hand, hand walking around through the woods and down to, the, to the, the lake at the bottom and feeding the ducks, and so on and so forth. And then in the evenings, they'd be sitting across from each other in the restaurant and gazing at e into each other's eyes longingly. They were there for the romance. They were there to get away from it all. This hotel was not in the accommodation business. It was in the romance business. See, the way you work out what business you're really in is determine what is the biggest benefit that you give to your customers. And that's it. The biggest benefit. And the biggest benefit they gave to their customers was romance. Gave people an opportunity to get away from it all and renew everything that they liked. So, three quick methods to gain confidence, as I said, and believability, coming back to this. Testimonials, guarantees, and positioning. Testimonials. Starting from today, my advice to you is get as many testimonials from satisfied customers as you can. Because the problem is with a lot of marketing messages is that that's you saying it. And people think, well, of course you're going to say that. You're trying to sell me stuff. But when other people say it, that's third-party endorsement. And that's what a testimonial is. Collect as many testimonials as possible and put them up everywhere. Put them on your website, in your sales literature. Mention them, discuss them in videos, whatever you can. The second one is guarantees. Have a look at what your competitors are doing. Do they offer a guarantee? Can you offer a guarantee? Think about this as well, just in case you're suspicious or worried about it. If somebody brings something back and, you, and they complain, would you take it back? The answer for a lot of people is yes. Therefore, why not advertise the fact? Suddenly, you've taken away a lot of the resistance that people have to buying. And number three, positioning we've already discussed. So let's have a look at some real powerful and proven methods of massively growing and developing your business right now, irrespective of the state of the economy. As I mentioned, guarantees. See, have a look at this graph here. Anytime a sale's made, somebody assumes more risk than the other. Who is it? It's the customer, the person that's paying the money. So what they do, they come in and then they wonder, well, what happens if your product doesn't work? What happens if it's the wrong color or it doesn't fit? What happens if I don't like it or something goes wrong with it? What happens then? So they have all of these worries. And so for a lot of people, you eliminate them along the way. In other words, these are barriers to the sale. So by putting a guarantee in place, what happens if my product or service doesn't work? Well, bring it back. What happens if it's the wrong color or doesn't fit? Bring it back. What happens if you don't deliver the service that I, I want and require? Bring it back. Now you've removed the barriers to the sale and more people buy. So a guarantee is a very good and very quick method of getting more customers to buy, to convert more in other words. So develop guarantees is number one. Oh, just in case you're wondering, because many people think this, well, if I, if I have a guarantee, surely a lot of people are going to take advantage of me. Well, that's the prevailing thinking. However, the facts are that you might get a few more guarantees, but you're going to make a lot more people happy, you're going to make a lot more sales, and the additional sales you make will more than offset those returns that you get. The other one is testimonials. Nobody likes to be the first to try anything. There was a book written several years ago about selling the intangible. One of the things that was in there was this principle of consensus or the herd mentality. People think this, well, if, some, if other people like me are buying this, then surely it's good for me too. Nobody likes to be the first. So by having testimonials, you're able to show people, you're able to display them on, your inter, on the internet, on your website, and in your literature, that other people like them have bought and tried this product and are very happy and satisfied. And the more details you give about who that person is, the better. Now, I remember as a kid buying American comic books and seeing testimonials for products that they used to sell, sell in there. 
and the Americans still do it now. This product is amazing. It's fantastic. I recommend you to buy JK, comma, TX. Now, who the hell is JK? And TX, well, that's Texas. We all think straight away they made that up. That's just made up. So those kinds of testimonials, without details of who said them, are totally worthless. They're going to do you more damage than they will do good. So what you want to do is you want to put who the person is, what they do, where they live perhaps, or at least their suburb. Even show a photograph of them smiling and happy with your, your product or service. These then look genuine. There is nothing better than this to develop instant credibility. One other thing actually, let me just go back to that slide. Getting testimonials is easy. You can send out a, a, a questionnaire to your customers. You can pitch them right there and then after they buy and ask them how they feel about the product or service they've just bought. Or you can even phone them up or email them and ask them what they think. Note down what they say over the telephone and then, then put it concisely in a nice way and read it back to them and say, is that what you said? Do you agree with that? And nine times out of ten, they're going to say yes, or they want to change it slightly. You've now got a testimonial that you can use. In other words, it's that easy to get them. Now, I mentioned before about this clutter factor. The clutter factor is what defeats most of us in our marketing and sales efforts. There's a very simple and age-old formula for doing effective and powerful marketing that will make you money. And it's called ADA. Now, it used to be called ADA. But that was before the internet came along and made it a little bit more difficult. ADA stands for attention, interest, credibility, desire or detail and action. All effective and good marketing follows this formula. You think about it, the first thing you've got to do is get somebody's attention. If you don't get attention, you've got no hope. The second thing is that once you've got their attention, you want to grab their interest. And that's done by putting a general benefit statement about how your product or service solves a problem that lots of people have. Credibility, tell them who you are. Put some testimonials in there, third party endorsements in other words. D, desire or detail. Tell them about how the product or service is going to, what it's going to do and how it's going to change their lives for the better in the future. Work on emotion. By the way, people don't buy on logic. They buy on emotion. People don't buy features, they buy benefits. In other words, what it does for me. Think about this, when you go into a hardware store to buy a quarter inch drill, do you really buy a quarter inch drill or do you buy a quarter inch hole in the wall? That's what you really want. That's the benefit of a quarter inch drill. In other words, it's this whole thing of selling the sizzle rather than the steak. And the last one is action. And this is what a lot of people forget in their marketing and their advertising. Telling people how to go about getting what it is that you're selling. You know, putting a coupon in there, a phone number, a website address, an email address. All of these things need to be in there. So this is a very simple, but time-tested, proven, effective formula to growing your sales straight away. Attention, interest, credibility, desire, and action. That's eight there. Finally, I want to share this with you, and this is one of the most effective ways that I know to quickly build profit almost immediately. I wanted that bit that went down there. Most of us, when we are looking to get customers or looking to grow our business, looking to grow our profits, we think about getting more customers. Now, getting more customers is all about increasing market share. Now, if your market is this pie here, that's your total universe, then your piece of that pie is representative here. If you're looking to get more customers, then you are looking to increase your portion of the pie. In other words, you want to grab customers from some other poor bugger. But there's an easier way than this, because finding new customers is seven to eight times more difficult than doing business with people that already know you. And that's what brings us on to wallet share. Wallet share is far easier, seven to eight times easier, seven to eight times more cheaper. And this is all about working out what else you can do for your customers right now. Now, McDonald's are absolute masters of this. Think about it. You walk into a McDonald's, as you can see that I do probably quite often, and you say, I'll have a quarter pound with cheese. 
And the first thing they say is, come on, I'm looking around and some of you I'm sure have worked there. Would you like fries with that, is what they say. The next time you go in, so that is what we call an upsell, isn't it? The next time you go in, you'll ask for a quarter pound with cheese meal. And they'll say, do you want to go large? There's another upsell. So the upsell or the cross sell, whichever way you want to put it, or even packaging, is a way of getting wallet share. In other words, digging deeper into your current customers' <coughs> pockets. And it's all about asking what else can you do for them? What other products or services that can you offer that is complementary or related to the products or services that you're selling right now? Now here are five quick wallet share strategies. As I've said, upsell, cross-selling, packaging and bundling, increasing buying frequency, in other words, getting them coming back more often, give them coupons, give them deals, give them reasons to return. JVs, that means joint ventures. Who can you team up with that's in a complementary but not competitive business that is serving the same sorts of customers as you are? There's another good way of doing wallet share. And finally, something that, that, that very few people think about, and that is past customer revival. In other words, people that once did business with you that, but don't do business with you anymore. Now, this is a sad but, but uh, 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 true fact that up to 64% of our customers stop doing business with us because they are dissatisfied. In other words, they are unhappy. They feel taken for granted. How can we start getting these people back? Well, writing them out a nice letter and making them an offer is a good idea. I've done this many times and it's very effective. Putting in a little coupon, telling them how sad you are that you haven't seen them for a while and inviting them back in again but give them a reason why they should come back. We call this an irresistible offer. Give them a discount, give them something extra. Give them anything, but get them back again. So these are all wallet share strategies. In other words, looking for ways of getting more out of our current customers, rather than the expensive and very difficult way using market share, which is finding new customers that don't know you. So, seven things to consider um, in wrapping this up, ask yourself, what business am I really in? Remember the railroad story, remember Domino's Pizza and the hotel. What business are you really in? That will give you positioning, that will allow you to develop a USP. Number two, what can you do to rise out of the clutter? All this marketing that everybody's doing confuses us all as soon as we open the newspaper every day or listen to the radio. Most of us don't listen to it, take no notice. It doesn't jump out at us. So how can you make your stuff jump out? Three reasons, remember, why people don't buy. They haven't got the money, they haven't got the need, or they haven't got the trust in you. And we know how to solve that. Develop guarantees and testimonials. Number five is use eight, eight uh, attention, interest, credibility, desire, and action. Get testimonials from all your clients. That's what you should be doing or customers straight away. And finally, because there's only seven there, use wallet stretch strategies for quick wins and fast cash. So there we go. That's in a nutshell, um, just uh, on half an hour as well, how to boost your sales and profits today. Not only survive, but thrive in a recession. Um, thank you very much for listening. One other thing I've got to say, um, I've written a book called Out of the Box Marketing. Um, if anybody, anybody would like a copy of this, Feel free to come and see me down at our stand. I don't know what number it is, but it's down at near the door. So uh, I'd be delighted to uh, see you. <coughs> if any of you also um, think you've got what it takes to be a business consultant and uh, teach this kind of stuff, which we would teach you to teach, then feel free to come and see me and talk about that as well. Uh, and on that note, thank you all very much for listening.